Hello and welcome to another cup of coffee with me, Sandy. Today I have got one of my oldest friends on the coast and everybody knows him. He is the foodie, he is the wine man, he knows everything about restaurants and his name is Gary Waite and everybody knows him not only on the coast but also in the UK. Morning Gary, how are you? Morning, Sandy. Well, after that intro, I better live up to that, did not I? <laughs> well, after the life you've had, I know that you're definitely going to. You're not going to disappoint us at all because you've got stories that come from way, way back. And I'm actually going to, I don't know how many people know really about your background. So I'm going to start right at the beginning. When you uh, were a young lad, probably about 10 or 12 years old, and you started a summer job at the Grand Spa Hotel in Bristol, correct? I was a bit older than that. I was um, I was fourteen. Oh, um, okay. Well, the only reason being that in those days um, you had well, actually, I was a bit younger than that, uh, but you had to be fourteen to to work. I think I was about thirteen and a half or something. Um, but it's only because I spent years being at the home, and you know, mum and dad throw a cocktail party, and I'd be there dishing out the booze or, or carrying the food around or something like that. And I was sitting outside with my mother one day, just on a summer holiday coming up and saying I wanted to do some work or get some income in for the summer holiday. And she said, well, why don't you, why don't you go to a hotel and, and work in a hotel? And I said, oh, I don't know if I could do that. And she said, well, you start, you know, start at the bottom. So I went along, strangely enough, to the Grand Spa Hotel, which is miles from where I lived. And I used to have to be there for breakfast. Um, so I had to be there for 6.30 in the morning, which meant the quarter to six bus from where I lived to get there in, in time to start work. And as I say, only a youngster. So, I mean, I was making all these things. And of course, I, I didn't leave there until around about nine o'clock at night because I wasn't allowed to stay on anyway. Because again, it would be too many hours. Sure. Um, and I just started, I just liked the, the lifestyle. I just liked the not my lifestyle, but the lifestyle of the people that were going in there. I mean, that was the, the, the thing, you know, fine frocks and nice wines and chandeliers and candles. And it, it just looks so nice, you know, and the old pianist in the corner giving it this. It was um, all, the I just all the elegance. So oh, really? when you were so young and you were doing that job, uh, did guests actually see you or were you only in the kitchen? Oh no no I no, no I was at, I was at the front of house I was a waiter yeah was we used waiting. to have to line up in the in the mornings with our fingers and make you sure that your hands to see the yeah. clean and and a clean right. handkerchief always have a clean handkerchief and always have a fountain pen because oh. in those days um, gentlemen didn't use biros so if they had oh. to sign a bill or a check you'd give them your fountain pen um, not a biro so or a ballpoint or whatever in those uh, days no I was definitely at the front. In those days of the elegance and the finery of uh, the hotel, did you meet or see any um, celebrities that you well, recognised? I mean, in those years, it wasn't really a celebrity culture like there is today. No. Um, no. The only person I really remember seeing um, was Cary Grant. Ah. And that's, well, his mother was in a nursing home in Clifton, because you probably know he was born in Bristol. Yes, so he, yes. Yeah, so his mother was in the nursing home in Bristol and he used to come over. But the funny thing was, um, the thing that he missed most about Los Angeles, or California in general, I suppose, um, was the stuff that he couldn't get. Like we were first when we came over to Spain, you know, you couldn't get your PG tips or you couldn't get this sort of thing. And the thing that he couldn't get was baked beans and, and pork sausages. No way. Uh, yeah, they couldn't get, the, you know, not but what we would call pork nice. sausages. They they get deli type stuff, you know, yeah. in the in the bellies and things, but he couldn't get good old English boyish sausages. So we used to have to cook in beans and sausages. But of course, in those days, when we delivered it, it came out on a, a silver cloche. Yeah. So you know, it would go down in front of him like that, and then it would be lifted up, yeah. and then and his sausage and beans and eat those. So, <laughs> but that's about the only guy I can remember seeing. A lot of of course, business people we used it a lot for entertainment. Sure. It's strange because uh, when I was uh, going to New York uh, once a month in my heyday, um, I stayed at the Ward Hotel in New York, and Cary Grant had uh, a penthouse that he kept there. And on several occasions when I was there, I was invited up to have drinks with him. 
So it's a, a strange connection between the two of us, which I didn't yeah. even know about. No, I didn't. didn't know about either. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you then, you finished school and you decided you were going to stay on as in the hotel industry. Well, yeah, my mother, I think my mother wanted me to be a doctor or gynecologist or something. I don't know if it's gynecologist because my middle name is Hamilton and that was named after my mother's gynecologist. So I, I thought, well, I'll be struck off. I'd be no good. I couldn't do that. You're just um, that she didn't call you Goldfinger. <laughs> So um, the other thing that I wouldn't have minded doing was um, a barrister. Mm -hmm. But the problem with being a barrister, it took a lot of hard work and education and studying, most of which I tried to avoid as much as possible. Um, but of course, it took on a more a, a different sort of hard work. Um, but I really wanted to be an actor. And I suppose the thing was so much time playing barristers like Perry Mason and all that sort of stuff. Um, I thought that would sort of be the same thing, really, you know, you have to get into court and, and do that. When I realised it would be hard work. Um, and then, of course, I went for an interview uh, from uh, Queen Elizabeth's Hospital School, which is, I, I was there, public school. And a few of us went up to RADA for, um, just for a chat, not an interview, just a chat. And um, the, the, the um, principal of RADA was telling us all, you do realise that for every um, Michael Caine and Sir Lawrence Olivier, there are 1,000 actors out of work. And I thought, yeah, that's the thing. Maybe not. So I knocked that on the head for the time being, although I carried on on an amateur basis anyway, um, and thought, well, I'll do what I really enjoy doing, which is hotels, which quite honestly is a stage. It's, it's still the same sort of thing. For you, it's always been a stage. Oh, yes, yeah, always. Um... In the times that I know you, which we will come to later, uh, you performed as well as host, the hostess with the mostest. But yeah. you opened up your first, your own first restaurant. And that to me was very strange because uh, it was on a Spanish theme. And I wondered why. Well, um, I've been to Spain um, quite a few times. Um, by then. In fact, the first time I came to Spain was with my parents uh, when I was nine. And we stayed in Palafruja near on the Costa Blanca, uh, Costa Brava, rather. And um, so I came then, and then I came over to Marbella when I was 18. Um, and then after that, I tended to go to um, Tenerife, which had become, started to become very popular. And so I went to Tenerife a lot. Um, my parents used to go far more than I did, um, but to the still to Spain in, in the mainland. And then when I came across this place, it was called the Little House Restaurant in, in Bleeden, which is just outside of Western Super Mare. It was just a lovely old country cottage. And it was my mother said, Oh, we should call it La Casita. That's Spanish, you know. And I thought, well, that's a good idea, mother. So we called it La Casita. But it did, I did, um, as, as I say in my book, I, I didn't even know at that time what Cuevas a la Flamenco was, because I'd never eaten them in Spain, you know. I'm probably still going to tourist places and eating garlic, mayonnaise and chicken and chips. But um, so I didn't even, I didn't know much about Spanish food, but it gave me a great opportunity to learn about it. And then I gave it all my own sort of twists. I mean, one of the most outrageous dishes I probably did was, um, was a hair in chocolate sauce, which was a, a Spanish dish. Yeah, and I used to do, but I couldn't put hair and chocolate sauce on the menu because, as you say, in those days nobody would have eaten it. No. So no. Had hair in a rich red wine sauce, Isn't and of course, that, oh, what was that? Was so good in you know, chocolate, you know? No. You were very much ahead of your time as far as putting chocolate in a recipe because uh, most in the dishes, last, I would say, ten years, if that. Chocolate is now accepted in a, a recipe. Well, in, in fairness, as I say, in Spain, it had been going for many, many years. Chocolate, they used to do um, partridge as well in, in chocolate sauce. And of course, the Mexicans have cooked with chocolate for years. Yes. yes. Um, so it, it was a little bit creative at the time. But so was a lot of the other dishes we did because I just like taking things and changing the way they looked. Um, so as they became, I mean, not like it is now, but certainly. 
1976, it was a, a very unusual way of, of um, uh, preparing and cooking food, especially with a Spanish twist to it. Your father helped you, was he front of house? Oh, bless yeah, his heart. Yeah. yeah, he used to, um, he, because the deal was, obviously we bought the restaurant and dad was the only one that had the, the wherewithal to buy it. And the idea was that they, they would stay in the restaurant because they had accommodation with it um, until I was on my feet and that I could buy the restaurant from him. And then they could move into another new house somewhere. Um, which is what we did. So my father worked in Bristol and it took, I can't remember, probably about 35, 40 minutes before he uh, could get to work. And he often used to come back at lunchtime as well. And then he would go back to work and then he would come back in the evening and then he'd work at the front of house, uh, taking the orders and, and looking after people because he was a, a bonhomie as well. And um, then he'd probably get to bed about one o'clock or something and then he'd be up again at six to go to work. So he did that for quite some time. Um, until I said, you can't do this anymore, Pop. Uh, you know, it's too much. Yeah. And so I got a couple of people on the front of house and alleviated that problem. And then eventually bought them out and, and um, they moved into another house in Sanford, which is about half an hour away. Your father also told you something. Do you recall what he told you? Oh, um, well, he told me a lot of things. Yeah, a couple of things one told thing me. he told you. Yeah, well, the two things are important, and I and I've got them in the book, and, and that is never worry about anything you can't do anything about, right. which I think is good. But on the opening day of the restaurant, we we had about well, we were full, and um, it was pretty stressful because I went in the kitchen, um, and you know I've never pretended to be a great chef, I, mean, I, I love consuming it, and I know how it should be done, but I've never been a um, a, a chef, I worked with a friend of mine called Neil Ramsey, no, no relation to, to Gordon, um, for six weeks or so before I opened it to work with him in his restaurant, just to get the feel of how to do it. Okay. So dad came into the kitchen and we we're already out the side and I went outside to make sure the table was done and everything. My, my sister and my mother were at the front of the house. And um, I said, you look a bit concerned, Pop. Are you, are you a, a, a bit worried about my capabilities? And he said, not your capability your culpability, and it's stuck with me forever because you can have the most capable person, okay. but if they can't cope with it, then you cope. And I, the I've numbers, got a feeling yeah. that in all the restaurants that you've opened, which you will go through, uh, you shared that with your staff in every place because that stuck with you and it's, it's with you to this day. Yeah. It's a mantra, yeah, I, I, especially in the kitchens yes. because chefs, Chefs like to, especially nowadays, they like to be very artistic, yes. um, uh, which is great. I mean, that's, you know, that's what it's all about. And as I said, it's something I've tried to do sort of all my career. But um, it's, you know, if you can do it that way for 10 people, great. But what happens if it's 50? You know, you're capable of doing it, but can you cope with the numbers? So I've maintained that capability and copability are two different things. You also opened uh, another restaurant, which was an old um, 11th Castle. century Yeah, 11th Castle. century castle. Yeah. Yeah, the Bristol, um, I, I sold um, La Casita in 1980. Somebody wanted to buy it. And um, I went into Bristol and I had a, a consultancy company. We were doing, we were the first people to do videos for, um, for properties. And Christie's, Christian coded it six months after we did, and I got a retraction from them in the catering hotel key because they, they had said they were the first and we were the first, but we were only a poxy little place. But um, I was doing that, and then the Bristol Council were looking for someone to take over the old castle vaults, which were 11th century. Um, in fairness, it was only the keep that was left. I mean, the castle had been destroyed hundreds and hundreds of years ago, but the keep had remained for forever and at the time I went to see it it was being used as a storeroom for the gardeners for all the machinery and um, they were so keen to have somebody open it and everything else and they gave me a lot of uh, help um, finance and everything um, and so I opened them um, I opened that and there you um, brought your food into the area of Nouveau Cuisine well we again we went a step up I mean a couple of things we did there we we did tapas um, which nobody had done 
tapas in the early 80s. I mean, you know, some of the famous tapas restaurants that exist nowadays weren't around then. Um, and I was also very naughty because I, I never obeyed the licensing laws. It's a bit late now if anybody's listening from Bristol City Council. Um, we I served. To get you, Gary, they're coming to yeah. get you. Um, there'll be a queue. Um, yeah, we served uh, drinks all day with food. I mean, we, well, that's yeah. not true. We served not drink to anybody who wanted it, really. But we concentrated on the food side. So we did tapas and we went a little bit more um, on the modern style and I don't like the word Nouvelle although Nouvelle was what it was called but you know I, I was a bit more substantial than Nouvelle people came and they could eat although I did have complaints sometimes that people went home and had a burger on the way but <laughs> well Nouvelle uh, came in at a time when uh, in fact uh, to my knowledge uh, was brought into the UK by my very close friends which were the Rue brothers and we just recently lost both of them Yes, and indeed. they brought in uh, Nouvelle Cuisine um, because I used to eat the Gavroche very often and also the Waterside Inn. Um, and that's how I remember that term coming in. And the small portion which actually suited me very well because I've never been a big eater. No, I mean, actually, the people, <clears throat> the Rue brothers worked with uh, Trois who was yep. the original man. Um, and they they were disciples of his, and he also brought in cuisine masseur, which was a, yeah. even a smaller portion. Uh, but it's funny you should say bringing those into the the, the ring because w when we did funky tapas here, all we were doing funky was we go fine dining later. We, yeah, fine dining in small portions. So it was like having a menu degustation. You could sit and have five or six. Dishes. So it was it was a similar thing to a menu degustation, but about a tenth of the price. But um, yeah, so that that we we did similar things um, at the restaurant, the Castle Park in, in Bristol. Okay, you came then. You came down to Marbella. You came down to the coast, and I'm sure that you loved the scenery, the food, the wine, and then you decided maybe this is where you would like to be. Yeah, um, a mate of mine who I met, um, who was a good friend now, I didn't know him at the time, but I went to a property exhibition. Um, and my girlfriend at the time said to me, why are we going to the Esso Motel, which was about 40 miles away? She said they have property exhibitions at the Holiday Inn next door to the restaurant every week. Why are we going all the way? I said, I don't know, just got a funny feeling. Um, I'll go out there, we'll have a bit of lunch, and then it'll be a day out and what have you. So we so I went up there and I was expecting this big, huge property exhibition. And I walked into the reception and nothing there at all. And I said, you've got a property exhibition. And he said, oh, you're downstairs on the right hand side, there's a room. So I went down into this room with a desk and a couple of girls in there. And I said, is this the property exhibition for Spain? And she said, oh yes, come this way. There's all these pictures. And I said, actually, I don't want that. I want a business. Oh, she said, we're not doing businesses, but when, when Barry comes down, you can uh, he'll tell you all about it. So this is where I met Barry. And then after a long conversation, he said, well, why don't you come over and have a look around and I'll show you some places. He said, where did you want? That was it. And I said, well, I thought Puerto Venus, something like that. And he said, no, no, no. You, you want friendly Fuengi or something like that. You don't want to, to go into places like Venus. Well, I couldn't have afforded it anyway. So um, that's what happened. So I came over and then I just thought, yeah, I can do this. So I moved over, following you. But uh, were you not offered a job here, which oh, didn't yeah, materialise? That's, that's a transient life. Um, Michael Knox Johnston, who is Robin Knox Johnston's brother. Well, I met Michael at the Don Carlos Hotel in 85. And um, I told him I was coming over and I was looking for a job. So he said, well, your background, etc." And he said, well, he said, we're looking for a director of food and beverage to start in January. And I thought, that's perfect. So long discussions, walked around the hotel, met the chef, da -da, shook hands, and everything else. Off I went, and then I came in from January. I came over with a pal, and um, after about five days here, I said, look, I better go down to the Don Carlos and just make sure about this job. So I went down to the Don Carlos, I went in and I said, can I speak to Michael Knox Johnson? And they said, who? And I said, Michael, not a job. he was your general manager. And she said, oh, he's, he left last year. 
oh, I said, well, I've got a job to start in January. And she said, just a minute. So this voice, <laughs> this bloke comes down and said, good grief, Gary, wait, what on earth are you doing here? And there's a guy called Stan Smith, who used to, I used to work with Camel Pe um, Foster, the um, accountants, came, you know, and, and I came down and I, and I thought, what are you doing here? Anyway, he'd taken over the, the direction of the company, but there was no job for me. So I realised how transient um, everybody was. And then about 10, no, a bit more than that, about 20 years later, maybe a little less, um, Michael Knox Johnston was working at the, Go the La Cala Golf Resort as general manager. So I went up there and I said to the secretary, can I speak to Michael Knox Johnson? And, and she said, who's, who's calling? I said, well, don't tell you who it is, just let me go in. So she let me go in and I said, hi. And I said, I've come for the job. And he said, what job? And I said, the job that you gave me in 1985 at Don Carlos. I've been looking for you ever since. I was just having a sip of coffee. And when you said that, I nearly choked on it. <laughs> okay, so you were down here, you suddenly had no job what did you then do oh, <clears throat> do you remember i had about three grand with me i think that's, that was my total amount there was a lot uh, in those days come on uh, uh, certainly enough to live in spain for a year sure, sure you know it wasn't that bad at all um and i got to know through barry i got to know loads of different people now, barry you the, talk about that is the lovely barry nathan i assume nathan, yeah. okay yeah, and he he introduced me to Manolo, I think his name was, who used to have the Maxis discotheque in uh, in uh, Fuengirola, which was where we all went nightclub. And he got me introduced to the Spanish guy, lovely guy, who had a restaurant in Fuengirola, and they were, wanted to revamp everything and and aim for a, um, an international market. But these guys were from Avila in the north, and that's how they the, the food they were doing was a bit too. For Fungirola, especially, it was a little yeah. bit too um, Spanish. Um, and they wanted to appeal to the tourists and everything else. So I changed the menus and did the work. So I worked with them for um, nine months, I think. And then I ended up going to the Oceano Hotel. Oh, sorry, Oceano Beach Club, as it was, in uh, 1987, I think. And, and then, then after that, it just got on from there. That changed your life because. You were with the Oceana, and then you've opened many... Mediterranean. Mediterranean was being built next door, right? And the company, um, the company that was running it was a company called Electrolux Hotel Management Services, and that's where I first was. Well, second time I met Mark Wardell, who became a great mate of mine, um, and they were running it, and they wanted me to take on the general manager's job of the of the club, which did didn't please the riders too much because of course it meant that all the members from Oceano, once once I left Oceano, it tended to dip a bit. So when I opened Mediterranean some six months later, you know, we had an influx of members from Oceano to join the um, the night uh, to join Mediterranean. Then after that, uh, the golf club Marbella, which fabulous job that one. That was a wonderful, wonderful oh, venue. Fun. And I remember having so many wonderful lunches there with you. Yeah. Really. yeah yeah. <clears throat> that was one of my favourite places, yeah. Yeah. And then really, in between, like an, an actor out of work, um, when I wasn't doing a project, which they all paid me reasonably well to do, I'd open a restaurant and, and find a little place somewhere and do something with it rather than sit on my back. So I'd do nothing. Give me an idea of the various restaurants that you have opened. I know the other one that I went to, which was uh, magnificent, was Tiki Tana. Yeah, that wasn't mine. That that was a yeah. company project. That was a project, um, but you were yeah. there. And if yeah. my memory is correct, that's where your wonderful trolley, your carving trolley, and no, no, no. carving trolley was uh, the Guadalupe in Venus. Ah, that was, okay. That was two thousand and. Oh, don't eight. worry about the year. Yeah, two thousand and eight. Yeah. But that that you, trolley. You that trolley has followed you. I mean, it's Gary with the trolley. That's right. Have trolley will travel. Absolutely. Have a trolley dolly, dear. That trolley dolly. And you didn't even have a, a trolley dolly uniform, but you no. were serving and you still carve. Uh, yeah. When asked, you still have the trolley. You still have that. And it's always pristine. 
and there you lift up the lid and there is that wonderful piece of meat that you then start carving at the table. And that even in the 21st century is still a showpiece. And that's oh, yeah. where the showman of you comes in because you are a showman. You went nice. to Rada, you spoke with them, but then you have acted here on the coast. Uh, and you've done supper theatre here on the coast as well. Very so, popular. Very popular. So you have really, you've had the best of both worlds because you've been the foodie, you've been the wine man, you've been in that area, culinary, but you've also integrated with theatre. Yeah. And that has made you very special because I don't know of any other restaurateurs who have got that sort of uh, I have to, I'd have to say my friend Francis Butler would be the, the oh, nearest. Oh, of course, yes. I forgot about Francis. Yes. <laughs> no, he, he was totally different to you. He was, uh, he had the elegance. Thank you. <laughs> uh, you, had, you had the charm. He had the elegance, you had the charm, and you've still got the charm. And he Francis, is. who is now still doing some radio work, it, he still comes across with elegance yeah he he's um he's a boisterous character to say the least he's a um, character as you are yeah. but he we actually it was like the odd couple really because um uh i first met him when he had just bought the finca finca Basaya. Basaya. yeah and he was just having friends around really and he would cook in the kitchen and, and then they'd all come there, we'd ever pay, they'd all get drunk and they'd all have a wonderful time. And of course, then Francis would realise and he ought to try and make this a serious business. So um, I went over and I, I, I went in the kitchen with him. Well, he went out the front and I said, look, you go out the front, that's where everybody wants you to be. And I'll do what I can in the kitchen to, to sort of maintain a standard and, and make a profit. Uh, so I was with him for quite some months and then I developed hepatitis. And um, from shellfish poisoning, I got that we, Chloe and I ate oysters and uh, we weren't ill ill with them, like throwing up or anything. It just developed the uh, hepatitis um, gene. Um, so I was out of work. I was couldn't, I couldn't do anything for about three months. I was flawed. So um, when I got back, France had gone back in the kitchen and, and that was it. So I didn't go back there. You've also, uh, I recall going to La Reserva which was a lovely, lovely restaurant. Yeah, so I, La Reserva was, was one of mine. That was yes. my own place, yes. um, which I took on after the, uh, after the Golf Club Marbella. After the Golf Club Marbella, I went to the Marbella Club in Puente Romana for a year. Yes. And then I left after the year's contract, and then I went to, I was an assistant to the managing director there, German guy. And then I left there, and I went and opened uh, La Reserva de Marbella. Um, and I was there for about four years. And that was in Elveria, right? Well, uh, that, yeah, uh, well, that was over in Marbella itself, which is uh, okay. near in that, it, it, it was um, east of Marbella. That's right, yeah. yeah. And then I was asked to take on the hotel, Oceano Hotel and Beachford. And oh, well, during the time I was there, I did Daphne's as well. I um, remember Daphne's. Do you, do you remember that we did an um a charity party for Kudeka there? Uh, well, we did quite a few things like that. I, I, I can't remember. Actually, yes, I do remember that because, yeah, yeah we're and in the main room with the roof, yeah. Morris Boland dressed up as a female, and I'm the only one that has still got the video of that complete opening. Good God. <laughs> We go back a long time, Gary, with you and I. I was thinking, I was thinking more of the image of Maurice Boland in drag. I don't know. Well, um, he raised a lot of money, which he has done for Kudeka and for many other charities on the coast. And I did the first commercial gig for Kudeka in the theatre where we did Gypsy. Really? And that was with Jackie Travis yeah. and Chloe Franks. Um, me, Maury, um, Phil Taylor's husband, and a beautiful girl whose name I cannot remember. If she ever sees this, I apologize. 
who played Gypsy Rose Lee. And I can't remember how much we made. I think we made 500,000 pesetas. And that was the first money that went into the pot to Kudeka. Well, I recall uh, when Kudeka was still under construction, Morris, uh, Joan Hunt, Marissa, myself were standing there and I took the photograph of the Kudeka and that photograph was now, is now used uh, on the roof of Kudeka. All right. Yeah. And uh, so our lives have all on the coast, the people that have been here a long time have all intertwined. But then let's go back to a wonderful restaurant that you opened in Nueva Andalusia, La Campana. Uh, yes, that was, um, that was after um, somebody came along and, and bought um, Guadalpin from me. It was very strange because I had a phone call from um, a lawyer, an Argentinian lawyer, and he said, um, uh, I understand your restaurant's uh, for sale. And I went, oh, didn't, not really. I said, I, I, I'm sort of subletting it if I can. And he said, well, we would like to take over the lease. And I said, uh, um, how much do you want for it? And I said, well, I don't really have anything to sell. I, you know, just a bit of goodwill, really. And he said, well, you've got the key. Oh, that was the, the, they, that, the owners of the company then came back, um, um, IFOS, and, and, and the managing director said, you've got the key. So these guys want it, sell them the key. So I said, how much do you want to pay for the key? And they did. So I moved out of there and I opened this little place, Campana, um, which I loved. I think it was a, a super little place. Oh. And I was there for till 2016, I think. Yeah, magic. And then you open, which I feel was the piece de resistance that you have ever done on this coast, Funky Tapa. Yeah. Funky Tapa was, I except for one restaurant in Puerto Buenos, and I'm not even going to mention the name, uh, you would, in front of uh, Funky Tapa, there would be lines of people waiting to go in. And that doesn't usually happen on this coast yeah. in a restaurant. Yeah. And yeah, we were very it, fortunate. it really was that special. I must admit it's, um... It, it, it's something that I'm most proud of. Again, not just me. I mean, it, you know, it, the, the team that put it together. I mean, Maurice was my head chef at, um, at La Campana, and he obviously did the menus and everything with me for the, for there. And the great advantage we had, which I don't think it would have worked otherwise, is we had La Campana's kitchens, because the kitchens we had at, at, at Funky Tapas were no bigger than a postage stamp. It was just a dispense kitchen. So all the work and all the preparation was being done down there. I mean, in those days, I mean, we didn't just make, you know, like 20 Yorkshire, uh, 20 cottage pies or whatever we would be making. You know, we were bulking it up constantly because as fast as we were making it, we, we were selling it. I mean, they used to come in at 12 o'clock in the morning. We didn't even know until one, but by 12 o'clock they were there waiting for the, the chefs to come into the kitchens and start serving. Yeah. And it just went on all day. It really, it really was quite a phenomenon. It was the most... In my book, it was the most special place that you opened. Mm. Uh, then you moved uh, to another area for Funky yeah, What happened was I got a bit stitched up in um, Nueva Andalucía, uh, which I won't go into, but no. basically yeah. um, you to do to with... You had to move. No, I had to, I had to move. I was pushed out, basically. Um, there was jealousy or controversy. I have no idea. And then I went, um, I, then I opened Oak for, um, for Ian Radford at the summer. Uh, they were opening this restaurant and they wanted to know if I'd be interested, which I would love to do, which I did. Um, and during the time there, this guy who I knew as a client um, at, at Funky came and he said, are you ever going to open Funky Tappers again? And I said, if somebody can come up with the, the right site at the right price and the right backing, um, yes, I'd love to. So about a year later, he said he still wanted to do this. Uh, he said, I've got this site down in Nueva Andalucía, which I knew because I looked at it as well. But at the time, they wanted far too much money for it. Um, so we went in together on doing that, which uh, once again, I um, can't remember who it said, but uh, partnerships, the only vessel that never sails. And, um, you know, and unfortunately, I got stitched up there. So. Yeah. 
And talking about sailing, you you actually worked on cruise ships as well. Oh, yes. So that should be obligatory for every young-blooded man from the age of 18 to 30. If you can't, if you can't put on a you can't put on a cruise line, you're never going to do anything. <laughs> Show me, Sorry, a, show me a man that hasn't pulled on a cruise liner and I exactly. don't want to meet him because I've made many, many cruises in my life and uh, it's a man's paradise because there are always so many women from young to old. It makes no difference of age. It's oh, just man. female, female and the hormones are just raising. We won't go into that. No, but, but if you want, if you want more detail, read the book because it's all in exactly that. That's where I'm coming to. <laughs> You're ahead of me, but we're on the same page. Yes. Um, so you have been hotelier, restaurant, restaurateur, actor. Um, uh, you cruised on the waves. Um, you had consultancy business. You have done so much in your life that you're also a great writer as well as a great raconteur. And I read that it was some years ago a book that you wrote called The Warm War. And I see of late you have reissued The Warm yeah. War, which is now being sold on Amazon. Yeah, I've done some private um, uh, signings as well last year, but we redid it again in, on 2019. So. Okay, okay. And uh, there is another book that you have written, which is also on uh, Amazon, and that's Half My Life. Tell me about yeah. Half My Life. Well, um, or have I you already to... told me about Half Your Life? No, 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 there's a lot more in it than that. Um, <laughs> Half my life is a, is a strange thing because I don't like to use the word autobiography because that sounds terribly grandiose and it's really left for people who have really done something with their lives. Um, mine is just a, um, it, I mean, I, I, I raconte like I write or I write like I raconte. Um, it's just, it's just it, as things came to me in memory, I happen to have a very good memory. And my idea was to write about half my life, which I have now lived in Spain half my life. So the idea was to write about my life in Spain since I arrived in 86. But I realized actually I had not a bad first half either. So the more I thought about it, I thought, well, let's write it half my life. And it's in two halves. It's true before I came to Spain and afterwards. Um, and the more I wrote about it, the more interested in it I became because I started remembering other things. And I'm sure if I read the book again, I probably left out tons of stuff that maybe I should but it, it, you know i thought well, if anybody gets 300 pages of this they're a braver man than i am so um i, I sort of brought it to a halt well no no where do you see your passion for writing came from i don't know but you know you know when you think of your life and, and you say i wonder why i did that and i think well i did that years ago and maybe i forgot that i did it enjoyed it um i started my my first book which never got anywhere because I never even, and I did it by hand anyway. Um, I think it was before steam typewriters were invented. But the, the first book I wrote was, um, uh, was uh, it was like a wind in the willows type thing. But the, the main guy was, was a badger and he was, he was a hedgehog, hedgehog, I think, I can't remember exactly. But he lived in this tree. But the trouble with, with, with my writing and, and ridiculous characterizations he actually drank a lot of port and had gout. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, why not? Hello? <laughs> so they do say everything's self-biographical, -bio so at this time I'm a hedgehog. But um, so I wrote that, and I wrote about 50 pages of that, and I thought, oh, that is no good. And then, of course, when I went on the cruise ships, when I first went on there, I went on as a waiter. Um, and I didn't want to work as a waiter anymore because I was full of bricklayers and, and carpenters and no, no waiters there at all. So I eventually got put up to section head waiter, which was stopped me carrying all these trays. Sure. And we did a world cruise. So I wrote the world cruise okay. but as a diary, yeah. um, which I then had enough to turn into a book by the time I'd been three months at sea, um, which I didn't do. 
but I suppose I incorporated it in a book that I've written in a half my life because a lot of the time, uh, not a lot of the time, but I've, I've spent quite a few pages on, on the trip and the people I met and, the, and things like that. Okay. In the background, I can see, and I don't know if my viewers can see, uh, the warm wall I can see sitting there. And if they want to get it, how do they get it on Amazon and also um, half my life? Just go on to Amazon Books, um, just on the website for Amazon. And yeah, it's going on dot yes. It's a double yeah, yeah. yeah. If you go on to Amazon dot yes, uh -huh. then you, and you live in Spain, then you don't pay delivery. Okay. High delivery. If you order it through the UK and you live in Spain, you'll pay for it to do it. So don't do that. So yeah. just go on to Amazon.es. And if you're in the UK, go .go.uk. And you'll have to type in because I'm not in the top 10 bestsellers. So not it doesn't pop up. Not yet, it. not yet. You never know what can happen. You never know what's around the corner. And talking yes. about what's around the corner, you've been on the coast for around about 35 years. Uh, what do you think you want to do now? If somebody was to say to you, Okay, Gary, you're sitting there, you're not doing anything of importance. Uh, what would your dream be now? Um, well, apart from winning the lottery, so I didn't have to do anything at all. Oh, don't be so nice. No, no, um, your brain would actify and that's not going to happen. Um, I, just, I, I get such a kick out of helping set up projects with people. Okay. I just like taking a blank oh, it sounds nap, taking a blank canvas and uh, allowing them to allow me to do what I I want to do and I, I wrote on Facebook the other day I, I dug up um, the menus from the Oceano Hotel and Beach Club from 2001. Yeah I saw that. You so saw that and that, that was a very I mean they were in Pesetas so that's how long ago it, it was and I looked at the menu and, and, and everything I thought God I remember we did that and I know remember the chef and everybody that was working there at the time and I thought, I do miss writing the menus and talking to chefs. And um, I've always gotten very well with most of my chefs because they know that I can, I can do it. So they can't pull the wool over my eyes. Not normally, anyway. I've had a couple of tried, but um, the best ones I've worked with, like Paul Tadwell, yeah, Paul, Maurice, um, Jason Whitlock, and a few others. They're absolutely, you know, they're all Michelin train chefs um and, but they've got no arrogance about them or, or anything they're just damn good chefs and i miss i miss the conversations i mean when we did funky tapas with maurice just sitting down and deciding what sort of dishes we were going to do and how we were going to present them and everything else yeah. um which i loved and, that, and that, that i miss so if anybody's got a project especially nowadays paul my colleagues in this industry at the moment are crying i, I are oh. crying I, I just don't understand how they're going to survive, some of them. So maybe, maybe you can put together the chefs that are not working and you're not working. Maybe you can put together something that is going to help everybody. You've got a brain, use it. And mm. well, I've got, um, a, put a project a, a, together that you and the chefs can, even if it is... Um, pop-up restaurant or yeah, something actually, like that when yeah. we have got the chance of opening up and we don't have the situation that we're all in worldwide but why don't you do that with your with your chefs until well, something really happens well i have a, a company well, company i have a, a little business called marbella cooking crew um, and which is exactly that. It's um, contacting all the chefs that are, are not working. But the, the, the tragedy down here is that ones that are not working have gone to other places now. Oh. I mean, recently is in Ireland. Um, Jason sadly is no longer working, but he went to Dubai. All the, all the, uh, Paul's still here and he's, yeah. but you know, we're all getting older as well. And that's another yes, thing in the kitchen, true. a yeah. young man's game at the best of time, you know. Yeah. But we do, you know, that was my intention. Um, we also started to do outside catering. And what I did was put chefs in, in, I would sort the menus out and everything else with the clients and then send the chefs down there and do it. And I just take an arrangement fee for doing it. So we've done a few of those. Um, but um, yeah, I don't know. 
I don't know what the future holds for the business at the moment. I really don't. I don't think any of us know what the future holds for any of us, uh, especially mm. in the hospitality industry. And all I can say that it's a day-to-day -day situation. Yeah. Each day we yeah. wake up and we say, thank you, dear Lord, that we are awake yeah. and we face it with positivity. And for me, this has been a wonderful uh, cup of coffee with you, Gary Waite. And I'm I so did. pleased that our lives have intertwined along the line with so many varied aspects. And I say thank you. And to my viewers, I say thank you for watching. I am sure that you have found Gary to be interesting, fun, and maybe find out things that you didn't really know about him. But he is available to start something new. So, Gary, wait, I say to you, thank you. Beso to you. And to my thank viewers, you. I say thank you so much. Take care. And I will see you again soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.